Good afternoon. Welcome to Integrated Pest Management, the first presentation of the third of the series for the Green, Clean, and Healthy Tribal Schools Initiative that are scheduled each Wednesday through February 22nd at this very same time. Several of the programs are double features, such as the two you are enjoying today. You're joining 94 other guests from communities, tribes, government agencies, universities, health and welfare organizations, schools, child care services, and businesses. Thank you for your interest in the health of our schools and communities. There are four ways that you'll be invited to participate in this and the other webinars in the series. Following the presentation, we will invite your questions. You may present a question or a comment in two ways. The first is to raise your hand. Simply click on the symbol of the hand on the control panel that you see on the right-hand side of your screen. During the question and answer session, I will open your microphone so that you can ask the question on the air. Other participants will hear your question and the presenter's answer. You may also submit a question by typing it in the question box in the lower part of the panel. I will forward that question on to the presenter. You'll remain anonymous unless you ask me specifically to include your name when I send on the question. In addition to today's two programs, four webinar topics have already been presented, and six more topics will be covered in the next three Wednesdays, including when, uh, recycling, composting, and gardening at school on February the 15th. Please join us for any or all of these programs. Links for registration can be found at www.epa.gov slash region 8 slash tribal schools. Nine diverse professionals, experts in their fields, will provide this and the other three weeks sessions in the event that you were unable to attend the first two double features, including school chemical clean out and lead based paint. These webinars will be available at www.epa.gov slash region 8 slash tribal schools. I'd like to introduce the people behind the scenes of the Clean, Green, and Healthy Tribal Schools Initiative. At the top left is the contract manager, Matthew Langenfeld. Matthew is also a, uh, was also a presenter and is the Chemical Initiative Coordinator for the Pollution Prevention and Toxics Unit of the Environmental Protection Agency in Region 8. Sean Lopez is president and owner of Orion Environmental. He is the project manager. Orion Environmental provides environmental site assessments abatement, removal, and inspections for schools and other buildings, contracting, and training. Finally, I am Dr. Carolina Smiley Marcus, the project coordinator and your facilitator for the webinars. I provide neutral and educational professional services, including facilitation of government to government and environmental issues and peacemaking, formally called transformative mediation. I'd like to introduce you to your speaker for today, Integrated Pest Management. Uh, his name is Michael Daniels. Mike provides training and technical assistance for safe pest control for schools and communities, especially in Indian Country. He has served as the Winnebago Omaha Pesticide Circuit Rider Coordinator and has been active in IPM pilot projects in all of South Dakota, Nebraska, the Winnebago Omaha Tribal Schools, and has participated in the 10th Indoor Air Quality Tools for Schools National Symposium. He's conducted a Healthy Tribal Communities training event and served as a delegate to the Tribal Pesticide Program Council. Mike works with state and federal agencies and with educational institutions, extension programs including the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, Iowa State University, the South Dakota State University. He currently works with the IPM Institute and the North Central IPM Center. Before Mike gives you the answer, before Michael gives you the answers, will you respond to two questions by selecting and clicking on the answer you prefer? After everyone has uh, has submitted their answers, I will share the results with you. So you should see the poll. The first thing to do for an integrated pest management approach is to, and if you will vote, good. I see people are voting. Mike, it looks like that there's some favorite answers here. A few more seconds. So about 85% of the folks have voted. I know that some don't have access to the voting, so we'll go ahead and close the poll and share the results with you. We'll see how well we do after the presentation. 
So it'll hide the results, and we have another question for you. So an IPM program determines the level of threat of pests and limits their presence by, again, if you will indicate your answer, about 50% of the people have voted. All right, we're about 90% have voted. We'll close the poll and share the results with you. Mike, it looks like that there's some disagreements in our group. All right, so we'll hide those results. And Mike will be talking with you about the importance of identifying pests in your schools and using the best ways to manage them. So, Michael? Hello, everybody. My name is Michael Daniels, and I'm an enrolled member of the Lord Brule Sioux Tribe up in beautiful South Dakota. Actually, I live in Winnebago, and I work in Winnebago, Omaha area, which is on the reservation. I have four daughters, and I think I have a personal stake in school IPM because all my daughters had to use a nebulizer when they were growing up, and a couple of them still do. And a large number of Native American families use them because of reactive airway disease. And we believe that uh, these synth synthetic pyrethroids that they use in the school's um, pest prevention programs have something to do with it. And I've been lucky enough to have, a, to, to have been part of a nationwide initiative to implement school IPM by 2015. And what school IPM does is to help eliminate pesticide exposure to children because of all the time that they spend there. And the mindset mostly is schools get sprayed once a month whether they're seeing bugs or not because of the contract that they have set up. And, and that goes along with the mindset of when people see a bug, the easiest way to take care of it is just find something and spray it. It's not the intent of IPM to get rid of the pest control company, but to keep them honest and to get them to practice school IPM. So today I'm going to talk to you about what school IPM is, the pests that are in schools, uh, the new program, of, it's called school IPM, the IPM components, the sites for IPM, and what your role can be. So what is school IPM? IPM looks for the best ways to manage pest problems with the least damage to the environment, people, and property. IPM considers all pest management strategy including careful use of pesticides when they're necessary. IPM protects people and property and is especially important around small children who have an increased hand-to-mouth exposure as well as differing development and metabolism. Asthma and air quality are both affected by pests and pesticide use because of the fecal matter, body dander, and the residuals of pesticide applications as well as as aerosol pesticides. In addition, these chemicals are known to have asthma links. There are also disease concerns associated with pests and pesticide use. Both acute and chronic issues are prevalent in many cases. So why should we consider IPM for schools? Well, because Schools are more populated and, and active than office buildings, of course, because they have classes Monday through Friday. They also have food service and athletic programs. There's also some community activities, you know, like uh, churches can have events in their recreational leagues, adult education, and community college classes. Uh, most most administrators, staff, and teachers are unaware of what is being used at their school. IPM is not about policing pest management. It's about working with your school to make decisions on the best way to handle pest problems. So what kind of pests are we talking about? 
that are in schools. Well, of course, ants. Everybody sees ants. And now we're, we're seeing bed bugs and head lice coming in and out of our schools. Bees, wasps, cockroaches, flies, mice, snakes, spiders, and weeds are also considered a pest. Because everybody has the mindset of when they see weeds, they just want to spray Roundup on it and kill it right away. And also uh, termites could be involved there also. So there's no federal pesticide use data requirement for, for pesticide use in schools at the moment. Out of the 110,000 schools in the nation, there's probably about 3,000 plus pesticides that are labeled for use in schools. And I guess Minnesota reports about 60% with routine applications, and Iowa is actually about 80% 80, 80 with monthly pesticide service. So right here we have some examples of some of the things that are being used in our schools. Now over on the, the far left we have the the famous lice killer, the all killer you can spray it on wherever you want. We have the mouse blocks and the roach killer. The, the problem with these is, is mis, misuse and exposure. And right here we have a picture of what it looks like under most of the, the sinks in, in a lot of the schools that I've been into. And it doesn't look too healthy to me. You have a plethora of over-the-counter items here right next to your paper towels that probably could be used, you know, to wipe your face. Here's another example of some common problems in schools, these over-the-counter pesticides that are readily available for school personnel to spray anything that moves. Here I'd like you to take note of uh, the decon and uh, the double control uh, raid max. The problem with the decon is that uh, it'll kill mice, but it also looks like candy and you probably won't be able to find where the mice, the mouse actually dies. So that could create a health problem further on down the line. Here we have a couple examples of some outdated chemicals that were actually found in schools. And we have uh, some black flag insect spray that actually contains D DDT. And the gopher getter, the type, type 1 bait, uh, contains strychnine. So we need to be aware of these, these products that are laying around our schools, you know, on the shelves that are, are most likely outdated. There's been a few bills that have been introduced uh, throughout the country and, and what they're saying is they want to require local educational agencies and schools to implement school IPM to minimize the use of pesticides in schools and prevent parents, gardens, and employees with notice of pesticide uses. And there's several people in Congress that support some type of integrated pest management plan for schools and properties right now, but it's still, it's still up in the air. These are some examples of the states that are being proactive. Where The blue represents the states where it's mandatory by law, by the state. The green where it's voluntary. Yellow is pending legislation and orange is post pre-notification. Also over on the right we have some, some pilot programs which are depicted by the red dots and the black dots represent coalition efforts. And I think that there should, there should be a representation there around Lincoln. There we do have a, a coalition effort going on there. So the harmful effects of pesticide exposure is, of course, uh, you know, it's, it's harmful or fatal if swallowed. And, uh, you know, of course, the, 
allergic and asthmatic responses, skin eye irritation, lung air irritation. Those are immediately noticed. And the, the delayed effects could be tumors, cancer, birth defects, blood nervous system disorders, hormone reproductive system effects. And they're just, they're just not healthy. We don't know what these chemicals are doing, these synthetic pyroids. We just don't know what they're doing to these kids. So why should we consider school IPM? Is mainly because of the children, you know, because they eat more, they drink more, they breathe more air compared to adults. They have greater contact with the environment compared with adults. And their systems, their little small systems are developing immune in, in uh, their different little uh, but pesticides that mimic natural hormones or synthetic pyrethroids are, are very much a problem and they have association with cancer or learning disabilities. So what what is the best strategy to take on IPM? Well, the first strategy is what what is the pest problem? We need to identify the pest, find out where it's coming from and why it's coming, why it is coming in there. Identification is, is necessary because all of these look like bees, but actually one of them doesn't sting. And I guess a wasp and related species, they're related species, but they have very different tactics on, on how to trap and lure them. Pheromone traps will not work on introduced species. And there's also some cool programs out there that will ID pests for you if you take a picture and send them in. Here's some more uh, identification. Uh, it's necessary for deciding how you're going to manage your pest problem. You know, they could be very obvious. Uh, the one where all the box elder bugs are around the hole, the logical thing to do would be to plug the hole. So how much and where can some intrusion be tolerated? That's what we have to decide. So we need to consider the short and long-term benefits. The short term is decisive management strategy to determine or destroy immediate pest problem. We want to make it safe for students and, and staff and an elimination of the health concern. Long term, of course, is making schools a core place for pests to gain entry and live. Reduces repeat complaints, saves time for custodial and maintenance staff, and it, it's it leads to better education setting and a better workplace. So the best IPM approach naturally is just to try to keep them out. By installing door sweeps, screen doors and windows, replacing the screen doors, places with points of entry, cop cracks and openings, and then, of course, outside use storage containers, contain the trash and compostables, get them away from the building, and then call cracks and openings again. So here's some more strategy. The areas that we need to concentrate are the kitchens, cafeteria, food storage areas, classrooms, office and staff lounges, locker rooms, and PE storage. Here are a couple examples of some core uh, storage practices and we have a, a good storage practice on the side. Everything is all in, in Tupperware, put up nice and neat, clean underneath where you can sweep and easily identify pests. So here are some examples of some more conducive conditions. We have a grease bin and garbage bin that is way too close to the building and then of course the door is wide open. 
Now the obvious problem is flies, pests, roach, even a horse could probably get in there through that open door. And we have some, some spillage over on the left. We need to get that picked up because that provides food for these, these pests. And also the, the cracked tiles and hollow legs, they provide harborage for pests and we might not ever be able to get to them. So here is some more examples of conducive conditions that are caused by, unfortunately, the teaching staff and the clutter provides nesting places for pests and it just doesn't look very nice in there. Here are some more examples where the problems are very obvious. A little bit of teamwork and effort could take care of a lot of these problems. We need to fix that door sweep so the pest can't go in and out. The gaps beside the pipes provide a travel passage from room to room for pests, so we need to get those packed with Portland cement and get the under, underneath of that counter straightened up a little bit. So IPM happens outdoors too. There's always pest management for lawns and turf. And we need to monitor outdoor nesting sites. We need to include woody ornamentals, add herbaceous perennials, and native grasses. So we really just don't want a bunch of plants next to the building. So here's some more examples of strategies for IPM. So we need to solicit, solicit staff participation, do regular inspections, sanitize, eliminate clutter, check your traps and clue boards, use old UV lights, check for, for mouse urine. If you use UV lights, they will the mouse urine will light up. And another use for UV lights is to attract flying insects. And we'd also like to see you use a lot of, of monitoring by uh, using blue boards. They're very inexpensive and very effective. So if you must use pests, must use chemicals, make sure that you're aware of the timing. Make sure you're aware of the the products that are used so they're not maybe restricted use or home remedies, broad, broad spectrum products, and applicators. Make sure that they're state certified, not someone's parents or someone that's unqualified with their home remedies. And then we need to have notification before treatment and after treatment. Usually there's none of that going on. I've seen applications going on while school's been in session. So we do have some success stories about school IPM. And one of them is Monroe County Community Schools in Bloomington, Indiana, where they've reported a 35% reduction in pest management costs and a 90% reduction in pesticide applications. They totally eliminated aerosol and liquid treatments. We have Kyrene School District in Tempe, Arizona that reported a 90% reduction in pesticide use and an 85% reduction in pest incidents. And that was a report following a midterm evaluation. The costs are similar to, to traditional chemically based programs. Santa Barbara County, California reported a, a reduction in roach count from 8.25 to 0.5. The pest control costs went from 1750 to 135 bucks and then of course it improved employee morale. So the pest management providers 
we're not trying to get rid of the, the pest control companies. We just want them to practice good, safe, integrated pest management. Now, integrated pest management is just a different approach. It's, it's cost effective. Ask them how, how they treat their pest problems, and they need to identify the pests first. Ask them to identify the products that they use, and don't expect the, the pest management team to do it all themselves because you have to be aware of what they're doing and make sure that they're doing it right. A lot of them set those, those mouse traps in there, the live traps in and behind uh, kitchen equipment, but they don't bother to come back in and, and take the dead bodies out. That's a, that's a health hazard. So you need to stay on the up and up with your pest companies. So the cost and benefit of, of IPM, the short-term cost may be higher in the beginning, but the long-term benefit is, is much greater. IPM is preventative, not reactive, and it's more cost-effective over time, for sure. So I've had the opportunity to be a part of some good demonstration product projects taking place in the country. And we had a, a demonstration project that took place up in the Flandreau uh, Brookings area. And it was actually the first program in public schools in South Dakota. And it was a cooperative effort from South Dakota State University, uh, my colleagues from UN, U University of Nebraska-Lincoln, Clyde Ogg and Aaron Bauer, ISU, Mark Schauer, and the South Dakota Dakota Department of Agriculture. And this is the beginning of the EPA's five-year plan to implement verifiable school IPM programs. And right now the EPA is developing national standards for school IPM. So it's definitely catching on. Uh, support and expand the number of schools who are implementing verifiable IPM. And I would like to thank uh, Dr. Carolina for asking me to present at this event. I'd like to Sean, uh, thank Sean Lopez and uh, Matthew Langenfeld, and also Sue Radcliffe and Tom Green. But if you have any kind of problems or anything, any kind of questions, don't hesitate to give me a call. And I thank you, everybody, for attending. And thank you, Michael. Uh, before we want to get to your questions next, but we hope Michael's presentation on integrated pest management has added to or refreshed your knowledge of the issue. Will you respond again to our polls to see uh, what you may have learned? I think the numbers might be different. And Michael, if you will watch this, you might have some things to say to people at the end of the polling. An integrated pest management program's first task is to, and if you'll please uh, let us know what your opinion is now, Quite a change so far in the voting. I do see a hand up, so I will get to you, by the way. About 80% have voted, and it's beginning to slow down. So I'll close the poll and share the results with you. So Michael, why don't we go to the next one, and then if you have a comment or two about what you're seeing. So here's the poll. Identifying the threat level of pests is followed by limiting their presence by and if you'll vote again, some split opinions here. 20% have voted, so 70% have voted. And we'll close the poll and share the results with you. So Michael, any comments about what, uh, how people are voting on the two polls? No, I don't have any comments right now. Okay, all right. So we'll hide those results, and we'll move forward with the questions. So I did see one person's hand up. John, your hand is up. Oh, you took it down. Okay. <laughs> all right, anybody else want to ask a question out loud? All right, and we have on the line also Rebecca Wilson. Rebecca is an intern with the Environmental Protection Agency. She is in the pollution prevention area. 
and has agreed to take a look at our questions. Rebecca, are there questions that have come in? I'll take a look at the see if we've got any questions for you, Michael. Um, here's one. If you must use chemicals, don't apply them when the kids are present. And this comes from Seth. Would you like to add to that? Yes, that's pretty much common sense. I've actually been in my office and had a, a pest control company come in and, and spray right around, try to spray around my desk. Needless to say, I didn't let them do it. But no, they, they need to spray on the weekends if they even need to spray. And they need to set up monitors so they can actually see if there is the need to spray. Because some of these pests, you know, like these uh, little Asian lady beetles, they're they may be a, a nuisance and everything, and they smell and they're a problem, but you don't need to spray for them. You could probably just as easily take care of them by vacuuming them up. All right. Well, thank you very much, Michael, for the presentation, and uh, thank you for participating in this presentation. Uh, remember that we have a second presentation, a double feature today, Green Cleaning with Marie Zanowick. And we will, uh, you'll see a blank screen for just a moment while we switch programs, but please stay tuned for that. I have a brief message regarding uh, the workshop that we're planning for the summer of 2012. And during this workshop, you'll have an opportunity to participate with speakers, including speakers, we hope, from our series of webinars. You'll have an opportunity to uh, interact not only with the speakers, but with presenters. So we hope that you'll let us know that you might be interested in participating in the workshop. So we're going to close the screen just for a moment in order to switch presentations, and we'll then hear from Marie Zanowick with regard to green cleaning. Thank you very much.